where the major peaks are to see what kind of, of uh, frequency bands we're hitting. So from this point on, this is all uh, unique code. Um, what I wanted to do was uh, create an interference signal um, instead of a random sequence and frequency. The bit I decided was always going to be one, but the frequency was going to vary pseudo-randomly. So I create the same number of bits and, and samples, um, just all with a value of one. You'll also notice that the BPSK modulated signal looks like a simple sine wave because, again, this, since there's no changing in bits variation, there's going to be no change in the phase. However, at the third box, you'll still see that interference spread um, with the six different frequencies. It, you know, they're repeating at random, which will create an interference frequency hot spread spectrum signal. So now we have these two signals potentially traveling through the air at the exact same time. Um, to evaluate how the received signal might come out, what we need to do is we need to split up the, the transmission signals into a series of frames of equal length. So since there's 25 bits, I made 25 frames, all of length of 120, um, so that we can start evaluating which transmit signal has priority. The assumption that I'm making here is that the interference signal has a higher power and will have priority. So to do this, I created a for loop to cut the signal into frames. Um, and then I created just an, an empty matrix, an empty column of vectors of just all, all zeros, just to speed up the process. Um, what I then took is I took the fast 4H, I divided up each signal, both the transmit signal and the interference signal into the frames and then took the fast Fourier transform of each individual frame and evaluated the two below. So I compare the two fast Fourier transform signals. If they're equal, I'll set a new signal, which was the empty column of vector of zeros. I'm going to set that uh, value equal to the jam signal. If the two fast Fourier transforms are the same, then the new signal will be the jam signal or the interference signal. Um, if they are not the same, then the original intended transmit signal will, will go through. Um, and then I have to turn this column of vectors into a row vector just for easier analysis. So this is what I get. The top one is the original transmit signal. The, the middle one is your interference signal, the, both the frequency hop spread spectrums. And then the last box is the new receive signal. Um, just at a glance here, you know, they, it, the new signal looks like the original signal, but further analysis needed to, and we need to demodulate to see what we really get. So again, because the master device and the slave device are paired up or synced to each other, they share the same clock, they're hopping at the same time, and that's why for the most part, demodulating is pretty easy. You just demodulate the receive signal by the original signal spread, um, and then you start just comparing the, the original bit sequence to your received bit, bit sequence. So in the lower right, you can see what was originally transmitted and what was received. Okay, so now let's start evaluating this. Um, the way I wanted to judge the robustness is by using the probability of no collisions for the PicoNet. So um, I did some research and I found this really nice uh, equation for the probability of no collisions for an n number of piconets um, and the denominator is usually the uh, number of channels used so in the in the case of this exercise where you have two piconets which is the original transmitted signal and then the interference signal and then we have six different frequ uh, frequency channels we're using which results in an 83 percent chance of no collisions um, for regular bluetooth i have it listed right below that um, with n, n pico nets, you have 1 minus 1 over 79 to the n minus 1. So if there's two Bluetooth devices within the same area, it has only a 97, excuse me, a 98% chance. So if you have two Bluetooth pico nets in the same room to, with each other operating at the same time, 
there is a 98.7% chance of no collision. So let's look at our bit sequence. And, and I've used red arrows to, to show the disparities between the original bit sequence and the receive sequence. So what that means is um, for three times, the both the transmit and the interference signal shared the exact same frequency band at the exact same time and returned the one value that was the interference signal. So what I wanted to do is start running through the cold code multiple times and look at how many errors do I get every time I run the code. Um, so we said that the probability of no collisions was at least 83%, and what I was returning was actually higher than that for my, my 10 run-throughs. Um, the highest number of errors I'd get would be four on attempt number three and attempt number eight, and even then it's at 84% of the success rate, which is pretty much on par. Um, if I were to add more channels, I would see a higher and higher success rate because the probability um, starts to get higher and higher. And then on the right, I wanted to show an example of zero errors in the code just to show that, that it is possible to transmit without any interference. So now at this time, I just wanted to go ahead and run through the code just to show you know, what kind of what I'm getting every time I press run. Okay, so here are my five windows. Move this over. So you have your original bit sequence as it runs through the BPSK modulation. You get your signal spread and your final frequency hop sp spread spectrum that is transmitted. Uh, and then here on figure three, we have our interference bit signal of all ones, no modulation in the BPSK, which is fine. Uh, we are multiplying that by the interference spread signal uh, to get your final frequency hop spread spectrum. And we compare the two. Okay. And when we finally demodulate, we can see some errors here. Let's see. Looks like one error right at 2000 and the other error right before 2500. So two errors in this case, which is about a 92% chance of no collision. This just goes to show how robust of a system it is. You can still transmit something and not have too much of fear of getting intercepted or having the data corrupted. So now let's look into some related work and new technology that's coming down the line. Um, as I mentioned before, is the concept of the internet of things. When it first was thought up in the 80s, um, it meant devices connected by cords, by wires. But as new technology like Bluetooth has come down the line and hit the market, uh, it's evolved to now include all sorts of different devices that not only can communicate with the user, but they connect to each other. There's also Bluetooth Low Energy, which includes uh, sensor beacons, um, that have now kind of morphed into an idea of making targeted ads, as in you could walk into a store, uh, and if you have some sensor on you, or you could use your, your phone as a sensor, uh, and we know what your buying habits from Amazon.com or what have you, we'll, we'll target ads as you walk through the store to try to get you to buy certain things to make that sale. That tends to be viewed as a very unpopular idea, just because it's kind of like you're you're intruding upon um, my habits and my my shopping habits. It's kind of viewed as spyware. However, uh, a new standard for Bluetooth, Bluetooth five, was just lease, released at the end of 2016, uh, and it boasts four times the range, twice the speed, and eight times the broadcasting capability. So this really goes into connecting all sorts of different sensors inside of your home. Um, to create that internet of things. Uh, one idea, there's a white paper written where we could extend the range. Bef this was written before Bluetooth 5 was announced, uh, but we could extend the range of all sorts of different Bluetooth enabled frequency hopping spread spectrum s sensors by using uh, Wi Fi ports. Um, so you can connect your window sensors and your door sensors for your a home alarm system to your Wi-Fi, use that as a gateway, um, where 
all of these different networks connect through the uh, router to send out and maybe it could be transmitted to your phone. I know I have an app on my phone that will let me know if someone opens up a door or window when they're not supposed to while I'm set away. But it can also connect your smartwatch um, to your phone and you don't have to necessarily have your phone on you at all times. With that increased range, you could you know, walk farther away, um, set up your stereo system in a larger room and not have to worry about your transmitter being closer. And it really boosts the autonomy of wearable technology, which is coming quickly. So in summary, you know, having especially done some research and, and using MATLAB, I, I really learned a lot about what goes into the frequency optics bed spectrum in this technology. Um, I really like how it's really resistant to interfering pico nets, where the more frequency bands you have, the more robust of a system it is, and the less of a chance of interception occurs. Um, it really helped nail down uh, other concepts that were, were taught, taught in the lectures about modulation and demodulation and, and why that's important when you're transmitting a signal. Um, I also learned a lot about a lot of the new civilian standards. Uh, the military, it takes a long time to update stuff. Uh, the, the acquisition process is a pretty slow process. But when the market is, is driven, um, like in a free market, you can get some new technology really, really quickly. So this Bluetooth 5 standard is going to open up a window of possibilities. And final point is the Internet of Things is, is coming and it's here to stay. So a lot of new things are coming down the lines. It's a really exciting time to to be a part of this and, and to explore Bluetooth and, and frequency hopping spread spectrum. All right, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Um, you can always send me a private message if you have any questions.